Welcome to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this video, I want to read an eyewitness account of the D-Day landing on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944. This account is from Robert Edlin, a soldier in the 2nd Ranger Battalion, part of the first wave to land on Omaha Beach. On this anniversary, let us remember their sacrifice and thank them for everything they did. Our assault boat hit a sandbar. I looked over the ramp and we were at least 75 yards from the shore. And we had hoped for a dry landing. I told the coxswain to try to get in further. He screamed he couldn't. That British seaman had all the guts in the world but couldn't get off the sandbar. I told him to drop the ramp or we were going to die right there. We had been trained for years not to go off the front of the ramp because the boat might get rocked by a wave and run over you. So we went off the sides. I looked to my right and saw a Company B boat next to us with Lieutenant Bob Fitzsimmons, a good friend, take a direct hit on the ramp from a mortar or mine. I thought there goes half of B Company. It was cold, miserably cold, even though it was June. The water temperature was probably 45 or 50 degrees. It was up to my shoulders when I went in. And I saw men sinking all about me. I tried to grab a couple, but my job was to get on in and get to the guns. There were bodies from the 116th floating everywhere. They were face down in the water with packs still on their backs. They had inflated their life jackets. Fortunately, most of the rangers did not inflate theirs, and they also might have turned over and drowned. I began to run with my rifle in front of me. I went directly across the beach to try to get to the seaway. In front of me was part of the 116th Infantry pinned down and lying behind beach obstacles. They had been into the seaway. I kept screaming at them, you have to get up and go. You gotta get up and go. But they didn't. They were worn out and defeated completely. There wasn't any time to help them. I continued to cross the beach. There were mines and obstacles all up and down the beach. The Air Corps had missed it entirely. There were no shell holes in which to take cover. The mines had not been detonated. Absolutely nothing that had been planned for for that part of the beach had worked. When I was about 20 yards from the seaway, I was hit by what I assume was a sniper bullet. It shattered and broke my right leg. I thought, well, I've got a purple heart. I fell and as I did, it was like a searing hot poker rammed into my leg. My rifle fell 10 or so feet in front of me. I crawled forward to get it, picked it up and as I rose on my left leg, Another burst of what I think machine gun fire tore the muscles out of that leg, knocking me down again. I lay there for seconds, looked ahead, and saw several rangers lying there. One was Butch Landern from Wisconsin. I screamed at Butch, get up and run. Butch, a big powerful man, looked back and said, I can't. I got up and hobbled towards him. He was lying on his stomach, his face in the sand. Then I saw the blood coming out of his back. I realized he had been hit in the stomach and the bullet had come out his spine and he was completely immobilized. Even then I was sorry for screaming at him, but I didn't have time to stop and help him. I thought, well, that's the end of Butch. Fortunately it wasn't. He became a farmer in Wisconsin. As I moved forward I hobbled. After you've been hit by gunfire your legs stiffen up, not all at once, but slowly. The pain was indescribable. I fell on my hands and knees and tried to crawl forwards. I managed a few yards, then blacked out for several minutes. When I came to, Sergeant Bill Klaus, he was up to the seaway. When he saw my predicament, he crawled back to me under heavy fire and mortar fire and dragged me up to the cover of the wall. Klaus had been wounded in one leg, and a medic gave him a shot of morphine. The medic did the same for me. My mental state was such that I told him to shoot it directly into my left leg, as that was what was hurting. He reminded me that if I took it in the arm, it would get to the leg. I told him to give me a second shot because I was hit in the other leg. He didn't. There were some rangers gathered at the seaway. Sergeant William Courtney, Private William Dreyer, Garfield Ray, Gabby Hart, Sergeant Charles Berg. I yelled at them, you have got to get off of here. You have to get up and get the guns. They were gone immediately. My platoon sergeant, Bill White, an ex-jockey, whom we called Whitey, took charge. He was small, very active, and very courageous. He led what few men were left out of the first platoon and started up the cliffs. 
I crawled and staggered forward as far as I could to some cover in the bushes behind a villa. There was a round stone well with a bucket and handle that turned the rope. It was so inviting. I was alone and I wanted that water so bad, but years of training told me it was a booby trap. I looked up at the top of the cliffs and thought, I can't make it on this leg. Where was everyone? Had they all quit? Then I heard Dreyer yelling, come on up, the trenches are empty. Then Kraut burp guns, cut loose. I thought, oh God, I can't get there. I heard an American Tommy gun and Courtney shouted, they're empty now. There was more German small arms fire and German grenades popping. I could hear Whitney yelling, cover me. I heard Garfield raise his Browning automatic rifle talking American. Then there was silence. Now, I thought, where are the fifth rangers? I turned and couldn't walk or even hobble anymore. I crawled back to the beach. I saw the fifth rangers coming through the smoke of a burning LST that had been hit by artillery fire. Colonel Schneider had seen the slaughter on the beaches and used his experience with the rangers in Africa, Sicily, and Anzio. He used the smoke as a screen and moved in behind it, saving the fifth rangers many casualties. My years of training told me there would be an a counterattack. My years of training told me that there would be a counterattack. I gathered the wounded by the seaway and told them to arm themselves as, as well as possible. I said if the Germans come we are either going to be captured or die on the beach, but we might as well take the Germans with us. I know it sounds ridiculous, but 10 or 15 rangers lay there, facing up to the cliffs, praying that Sergeant White, Courtney Dreyer, and the 5th Ranger Battalion would get to the guns. Our fight was over unless the Germans counterattacked. I looked back to the sea. There was nothing. There were no reinforcements. I thought the invasion had been abandoned. We would be dead or prisoners soon. Everyone had withdrawn and left us. Well, we had tried. Some guy crawled over and told me he was a colonel from the 29th Infantry Division. He said for us to relax, we were going to be okay. D, E, and F companies were on the point. The guns had been destroyed. A and B companies and the 5th Rangers were inland. The 29th and 1st Divisions were getting off the beaches. The colonel looked at me and said, You've done your job. I answered, How? By using up two rounds of German ammo on my leg. Despite the awful pain, I hope to catch up with the platoon the next day. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please share the video to get the word out about the channel and stay tuned for more eyewitness accounts. I leave you with the words of George S. Patton and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Every single man in this army plays a vital role. Don't ever let up. Don't ever think that your job is unimportant. Every man has a job to do, and he must do it. Every man is a vital link in the great chain. Democracy alone of all forms of government enlists the full force of men's enlightened will. It is the most humane, the most advanced, and in the end, the most unconquerable of all human society. The democratic aspiration is no mere recent phase of human history. We would rather die on our feet than live on our knees.